good afternoon everybody welcome to the monthly clinical meeting of the sri lanka medical association uh, end of the year we are collaborating with the sri lanka college of cardiology uh, for this meeting uh, we'll be having two interesting uh, uh, case presentation and a mcq session on cardiology today uh, the first it will be by dr sumita kumar senior registrar in cardiology general hospital candy he'll be talking about uh, challenging diagnosis of st elevation myocardial infarction a case presentation and a discussion followed by that and the mcq session will be done by dr anura aruna vijaysingh consultant cardiologist at the base hospital uh, panadura on behalf of the uh, sri lanka medical association i would warmly welcome both of you and thank the uh, sri lanka college of cardiology for this uh, collaboration uh, let me invite uh, dr sumit kumar to uh, start his case presentation thank you very much sir good afternoon Uh, to both uh, who are physically present here as well as uh, joining us via online so i will move on to my presentation so my topic is uh, challenge in diagnosis of st elevation myocardial infarction it first would be a case the case presentation sir true case so the history 50 year old non patient with hypertension presented to a ho local hospital with sudden onset of retrosternal chest pain for 2 hours duration chest pain associated with vomiting sweating left arm numbness which is more suggestive of ischemia and no fever or history of exertional angina on examination at local hospital pulse rate 60 blood pressure 80 by 50 saturation is normal respiratory abdominal neurological examinations were normal so this is a ecg been taken at local hospital so i would appreciate uh, if you can give me the diagnosis which is simple can they speak or participants uh, please make it i know the difficulty but if you can respond we can hear you we have unmuted the, all the mic so if somebody can give the diagnosis it would be interesting okay so yeah it's obvious that uh, the significant st elevation in inferior lead cell 2 l3 and avf with reciprocal changes mainly avl otherwise uh, there are no features of arrhythmias v1 to v6 uh, appears normal so diagnosis is inferior st elevation myocardial infarction which is acute so just to remember the definition of st elevation which is a j point elevation two in two contiguous leads more than one small squares in all leads other than the v2 to v3 in v2 to v3 the following cut points apply more than two small squares st elevation in men more than 40 years 2.5 small squares in men <clears throat> less than 40 years and in women more than 0.15 uh, mm apply so the management at local hospital is cardiac monitoring which is obvious we have to do aspirin clopidogrel and atorvastatin stat doses fluid resuscitation because of low blood pressure <clears throat> and uh, because of persistent low blood pressure they have started anatrox dobutamine to up blood pressure and they have thrombolyzed with tenectoprice so following thrombolysis chest pain mild improved but uh, patient needed anatrox support to maintain blood pressure ecg changes i will show you 
mild improved and patient was transferred to tertiary care hospital for intervention due to persistent hypotension what are the possible causes for persistent hypotension in this case you can put in the chat if you want to earlier somebody has responded saying inferior mi yeah yeah uh, there are several possible causes <clears throat> in patient with inferior myocardial infarction possibility of right ventricular involvement but uh, b4 or post normal possibility of arrhythmia especially it is common to have arrhythmias in inferior stage elevation myocardial infarction heart blocks atrial fibrillation anything can cause uh, heart uh, hypertension could be due to heart failure and is there a possibility of well involvement in inferior stellation myocardial infarction i have put a picture here so when you consider the papillary muscles so posterior medial papillary muscle blood supply may be from right coronary artery so we commonly see mitral regurgitation acute mitral regurgitation in uh, anterior myocardial infarction but it can be due to inferior myocardial infarction as well possibility of aortic dissection in the patient with chest pain we have to look at that and possibility of bleeding so the ecg uh, the, when the patient was transferred to tertiary care hospital our hospital this is the ecg at atu so when you look at the ecg again there is persistence of st elevation in inferior leads with the presence of reciprocal changes so there is no even partial resolution of uh, st elevation after thrombolysis there are no features of arrhythmia so because i mentioned that we thought of arrhythmias for the persistent hypotension but there is no arrhythmia so patient was directly taken to the cath lab that's the usual habit when patient was uh, taken uh, patient in the etu they contact us so when the when we see the ecg and uh, there are features of st elevation acute st elevation myocardial infarction without delay we take patient directly to the cath lab for the interventions so this is the angiography performed so this is the right coronary artery so there is critical stenosis in the proximal right coronary artery so this is during systole and this is during diastole and this is the left uh, main system as well as complex uh, and lad so which is normal left system is normal right system there is critical stenosis in proximal right coronary artery so is is there any difference of uh, two views of right coronary artery so this is during systole which is this yes critical stenosis but there is some relief of stenosis in diastole so there is dynamicity what is the possible cause can a uh, difficult thing actually so rescue pcr to rc was performed so which is the usual management so following pci to right coronary artery the shock was worsen and follow up pcg review resolution of st elevation in inferior leads no arrhythmias so it is possible to have persistent hypotension in a patient with inferior st elevation and infarction even after uh, rescue pc or even primary pc but uh, so anyway it um, but it was marked liver the blood pressure and symptoms so we have reviewed the history and examination on uh, the history is same patient complain of on the history of chest pain central chest pain and on examination there was a diastolic murmur at right lower sternal border and low volume pulse which is which was not specific because patient is having hypotension 
So this is ECG after prime uh, rescue PCI short resolution of ST elevations in inferior leaks. So after that, patient uh, at uh, CCU, the bedside 2D echocardiogram was performed, which shows uh, inferior hypokinesia with normal other segments. And it also showed dias uh, dilated aortic root with moderate aortic regurgitation with mild left sided pleural effusion. So the diagnosis is now obvious. So the diagnosis is now obvious, which is uh, an aortic dissection actually, which has been extended to the right coronary artery. So this is a diagnosis, uh, I mean, the, anyway, mismanaged with as stellation myocardial infarction, inferior myocardial infarction. So we have performed the chest X-ray, which shows uh, some mediastinal widening. There is no uh, with left smile, left sided pleural effusion, and we have arranged urgent CT uh, autogram, which confirm the diagnosis of uh, aortic dissection due to abdominal aortic aneurysm, which has extended to the right coronary artery. So. The final diagnosis of Stanford type A aortic dissection with RCA involvement. Anyway, patient urgently preferred for surgery, but died during surgery. So it's very important to remember that estimated 38% of acute aortic dissections are missed on initial evaluation because needs a high index of clinical suspicion. So in case of chest pain, always exclude the possibility of dissection by history. So thorough history is the important thing in the initial evaluation. But history may be misleading, examination may be misleading as well as the ECG, even ECG may be misleading. Anybody who sees, and who sees that first ECG with the history of chest pain, I mean, it's rare to think about possibility of aortic dissection rather than acute STLS myocardial infarction. So, 3% of aortic dissections associated with uh, coronary artery involvement, main right coronary artery, but can be the left coronary artery as well. So, it may present as, an present as anterior STLS myocardial various complications. So challenging and misdiagnosis very common in patients. So the important aspect is the inappropriate treatment with antiplatelets, antithrombin, and thrombolytic cage cause catastrophic bleeding. So that might have the cause, might could have been the cause uh, for that patient's uh, deterioration. The important thing I want to highlight here, the most physicians are under constant pressure to achieve guideline recommended reperfusion goal. So this is very important because it's obvious and we have the, we all know that. So when the, when we have guidelines, so they have, they are a time limit. So we are usually adhere to those. Things. So we want to do it as quick as possible. So we, uh, we would uh, we, uh, may, uh, forget the basic things on evaluation. So with that, uh, I will go to the go to some uh, details about aortic dissection. So <clears throat> the first well documented case of aortic dissection in uh, 1760, when King George II in England died while on straining on, on the comet due to aortic dissection. So in 1761, Italian anatomist uh, <clears throat> Giovanni Battista provided the first detailed pathologic description of aortic dissection. The D. Becky performed first successful operative repairs, which is a well-known name with related to aortic dissection. 
so it's a aortic dissection it's a disease of aortic wall which uh, which tear in the intimal layer results propagation of dissection even proximally or distal secondary to blood entering into the intima media space so what is the difference between uh, the aortic wall and the peripheral arterial wall which in which aorta is more prone to get dissections and it cause propagation of dissection as well because the aorta has very less smooth muscle it has more elastic tissue and because because of that the possibility of propagation and uh, dissection is very high in aorta compared to the peripheral arteries so what happens is in intimal layer the tear connects the media with aortic loop so which ultimately results to lumen and falls lumen which we call double barrel aorta so most classic aortic dissections begin one of the following three distinction distinct anatomic locations most of the 90% of aortic dissections occurs in proximal aorta within 10 cm from the aortic wall which would uh, which is the which is which, which may lead to more uh, more mortality than uh, when we consider the descending aortic aorta dissections and the second uh, secondly it is uh, distal to the left subclavian artery and lastly the aortic arch so when you can look at the anatomy around the aorta and the proximal aorta the lot of it is complicated and lot of important and vital structures are there the heart nerves trachea esophagus so branches of the arteries all are there so again increase the possibility of high mortality and morbidity as well so it is when you look at the mortality it is 20 to 50% within first 24 to 48 hours it is increasing by 1% in every passing hour so by one week from first two weeks it's the mortality is about 75% so see that the degree and uh, it is 90% in first three months so it is, it is very very critical so the mortality is highest, highest in first seven days and many patients die before the presentation to the emergency department or before the diagnosis is made is more in female sorry male than female and most frequent seen in fifth and sixth decades of life it is the mortality of aortic dissections are still high despite of the advancement of diagnostic and therapeutic uh, modalities when you go to the classification so d bacchi and stanford classification the, the b bacchi classification mainly depend on the site of the aortic dissection so if uh, there's involvement of the proximal aorta and extended to the uh, even descending aorta which we call type 1 in d bacchi classification in type 2 it the dissection is confined to the uh, ascending aorta and type 3 it is the descending aorta so stanford classification which is the mostly most frequently used one and simple one type a and type b in type b whatever the proximal aorta in is involved it is type a the proximal aorta is not involved it is type b so there is factors we can divide into congenital hereditary and acquired so bicuspid uh, aortic wall and tetralogy of fallot they are at high risk of aortic dissection and uh, the hereditary causes connective tissue disease such as marfan and uh, other family aortic syndrome autosomic dominant syn- uh, and sporadic cases the acquired causes hypertension which is the most frequent uh, risk uh, and common risk factor for 
aortic dissection, other infections such as syphilis, uh, viral and bacterial infection, they are more prone to get uh, if, uh, aneurysms, uh, which cause uh, ultimately cause uh, causing aortic dissection. Other autoimmune causes, Takayasu's disease, Bacchus disease, also are more prone to get aortic dissection. But other acquired causes uh, as well, such as uh, after surgery, uh, the cardiothoracic surgeries, they are more prone to get aortic dissections. So this is the, the most important thing, <coughs> the evaluation of the history and examination. So when you go to the history, the chest pain, what is the typical chest pain of aortic dissection? This sudden onset and maximum severity of chest pain is at onset which compared to the other causes of chest, central chest pain. But it may be as a diversity of chest pain. It may be mild chest pain to more severe chest pain. So we, we, even mild chest pain, we might uh, mistakenly diagnose as musculoskeletal chest pain or gastritis or something. So again, remember, sudden onset and maximum severity of chest pain at onset. Location of chest pain. So anterior chest pain, which mimics acute myocardial infarction, usually associated with aortic arch and root dissection. And where neck pain and jaw pain, which associated with arch, which uh, and extend to the greater vessels. Tearing or ripping pain in intrascapular area may indicate that dissection involved the descending aorta. Why I have highlighted? Because we learned that uh, interscapular pain is the most specific thing in aortic dissection, but it's not the actual uh, thing. Because 90% of aortic dissection occurs in the ascending aorta, so the pain is not the actual interscapular with the central chest pain, but it can cause interscapular pain because aortic dissection can extend to the arch as well as the descending aorta. So, Actually, is it, is it actually in, in the scapular pain, which is more worrying or central chest pain? We have decided. And so in patient person with typical chest pain without ECG changes, so think about aortic dissection rather than unstable engine or other diagnosis. So painless aortic dissection common with Marfan syndrome and other neurological diseases. 5% of patients comes with syncopal and syncopal. Maybe due to increased vagal tone, hypovolemia, or dysarrhythmias, which might be diagnosed by ECG. And other aspect, cerebral accident. They will come with hemianesthesia, hemiparesis, hemiplegia. It is obviously misleading. Horner syndrome caused by interruption of cervical sympathetic ganglion. So, and hoarseness of voice due to uh, interruption of recurrent laryngeal nerve. So, there are various presentations. Can present with dyspnea or orthopnea due to acute tear, pericardial effusion, hemothorax. Comes with hemoptysis due to ruptured uh, aortic aneurysm due to uh, due to a trachea and bronchial obstruction. Dyspagia due to compression of the esophagus and flank pain due to renal artery involvement. Abdominal pain due to dissection involving the abdominal aorta. Claudications, hematuria. So see the diversity of this presentation. So some people end up with neurology or some medical or cardiology. So, so initial evaluation is the most important suspicion. The possibility of aortic dissection is the most important thing in the beginning. When you go to the literature and case reports, you will see the, all, all the ways of presentation of aortic dissection in this, uh, in, uh, this kind of patients. They may present with the Horner's syndrome. They may have presented with the uh, hoarseness of voice. On physical examination, we'll go by one by one. The pulse would be low volume pulse, bounding pulse, 
radio there may be radio 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 chemotherapy so thorough examination is in very basic things in elevated jugular venous pressure can be due to cardiac thing and kusmaul sign what is kusmaul sign so during means uh, inspiration the cardio thoracic pressure reduces and jvp reduces but in this kind of patients due to cardiac tamponade or those things the pressure actually jvp pressure increases during inspiration the blood pressure white blood pressure uh, pulse pressure can be explained by presence of aortic regurgitation hypertension hypotension hypotension be due to vagal uh, excessive vagal vagal tone cardiac tamponade or due to hypovolemia and blood pressure difference in, in arms significant if it is more than 20 and pulses paradox which is abnormally large decrease in stroke volume um and which is systolic blood pressure is usually 8 to 12 uh, but it is even more than that in patients with aortic dissection proscultation aortic regurgitation murmur which is diastolic murmur heard that right lower sternum which why right lower sternum which is not uh, which is more common in left lower sternum because valvular lesions valvular aortic lesions cause diastolic murmur at left lower sternum whereas dilated aortic root causing aortic regurgitation which presents as diastolic murmur at right lower sternum which, which is please uh, remember this when valvular lesions again i am telling valvular lesions causing aortic regurgitation diastolic murmur usually heard that left lower sternum right? whereas die due to dilated aortic root causing aortic regurgitation the murmur best heard in the right lower sternum then a muffled heart sound and pericardial rupt and neurological deficit 20% of cases we uh, it reports a neurological deficit have do the abdominal examination you might find aneurysms and respiratory examinations so also compulsory so again i remember each presentation has differential diagnosis so this is again necessitating of high index of clinical suspicion following proper clinical history and examination so investigations is mainly the uh, imaging but uh, we can go start with the 12 lead dcg maybe there are not specific diagnosis but uh, it may be again misleading as well which has happened to the case where i have present chest x ray even not like in old days with digital chest x ray at bedside we can interpret in about 1 to 2 minutes without taken print, print uh, printed copies so i will show what are the uh, features suggestive of aortic dissection in chest x ray other uh, in image modality such as ct angiogram which is three dimensional and reconstruction ct and mri which are not uh, readily available aortography which is out out of date now and the echocardiogram chest x ray may be informative uh, maybe features suggestive of aneurysms so the most common thing is the mediastinal void due to uh, the aortic dissection there may be evidence of pleural effusion which may be either unilateral or bilateral and this uh, this calcification sign which is separation of intimal calcification from the outer aortic soft tissue border more than 10 mm these things are very rare seen and also inserted as well when you go to the echocardiogram trans esophageal echocardiogram which has significant sensitivity sensitivity and specificity as well but <clears throat> it is less than trans thoracic echocardiogram so trans thoracic echocardiography most useful in ascending aortic dissections is again important to remember 
trans esophageal echocardiography is accurate as CT and MR in terms of sensitivity and specificity, which can be used at bedside. Is it actually possible to use at bedside? Because when you go to the principles of management of aortic dissection, so we have to comfort the patient as much as possible. So that's the and worrying thing. So it's difficult. Where so why we can't proceed with trans esophageal echocardiography? Because it is uncomfortable to the patients and it is against the principles of management of aortic dissection. But again, remember, it is accurate as CT and MRI in terms of sensitivity and specificity. So in echocardiography, you see in trans thoracic echocardiography, the dissection flap, aortic regurgitation, pericardial effusion, pleural effusion, it's informative. And in uh, trans esophageal echocardiography, again, more informative, we see the pulse lumen and true lumen, regurgitation, dissection flaps, but there are drawbacks as well. We can't see the extent of the aortic dissection. Probably we might not see the site of tear, but informative. Moving to the management, again, the acute management, which is the important part. So usually at ICU because patient need the arterial BP monitoring, central venous pressure monitoring, and during output monitoring, pain control, and uh, the next thing is the reduced cardiac contractility via beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. So the drugs such as nitroposide, labitalol, and calcium channel blockers are having both the uh, effect of lowering blood pressure as well as the reducing effect uh, contractility. Hydralcine is contraindicated because it causes reflex tachycardia. The target heart rate around 60 and systolic blood pressure 100 to 120. So if it is patient is having high blood pressure, the our time target within minutes to hour, we have to uh, reduce the blood pressure 100 to 120, which is the systolic blood pressure. In type 1 aortic dissection, surgery is the treatment of choice. So it is simple. Why? The type A aortic dissection has mortality of 50% within first 48 hours, if not operated. And the surgery reduces one month mortality from 90 to 30, which is very significant. So in type 1 A aortic dissection, surgery is the treatment of choice. But according to the studies, the in the in presence of uh, uh, visceral ischemia and in presence of neurological symptoms, the it is controversial whether the surgery should be performed or not. But uh, the studies have shown that even in patients with neurological symptoms due to poor brain uh, organ perfusion and brain perfusion, we have uh, successfully done the surgery within five hours. The outcome is good. So main purpose of the surgery is resection of the primary endocyte and repair. Type in treatment of type B aortic dissection. Usually, uh, the cause of type B aortic dissection is uh, is usually uncomplicated. So, in the absence of malperfusion or signs of uh, disease progression, patient can be safely stabilized under the under medical care. So, again, the same principles of as I mentioned previously, controlling pain, heart rate, blood pressure, repetitive imaging, the management approach. So what about thoracic endovascular aortic repair? So <clears throat> in uh, type B aortic dissection, which is uncomplicated, there are studies that uh, despite of medical therapy in some uh, in patients, some patients, they have performed thoracic endovascular aortic repair. So what is the outcome? So aortic dissection related mortality is less in five year follow up period, but no difference in uh, total mortality in five year follow up period. So it is by a femoral approach like stenting. It is uh, the endovascular aortic repair can be performed, but 
It's not freely available because of the cost. In complicated type B aortic dissection, the thoracic endovascular repair is the treatment of choice. And surgery indicated in lower extremity artery disease, severe toe to sit in iliac, iliac arteries and sharp angulation of aortic arch. So in these kind of situations, we have to go for open surgery. Again, uh, in type B aortic dissection, there are two pathways, which is complicated or uncomplicated. In uncomplicated one, the usual is medical management with uh, continuous thorough monitoring. If it is indicated, can go for endovascular treatment. It's a complicated one. It is definitely endovascular treatment is the first choice, but in some uh, situations, surgery is the treatment of choice. So the key message, the thorough clinical evaluation with the history and examination is the best approach for any patients. Thank you. Online. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sumit, for that very clinically oriented, interesting case. Uh, the audience is encouraged to ask. I think you you have been uh, unmuted. You can ask your questions, or you can type it in the chat box where I will ask the uh, speaker to respond. While waiting for the questions, uh, let me uh, ask you a question. So it was a very interesting case. <clears throat> Going back to our medical wards 20, 25 years ago, the, with the very basics, uh, what are your thoughts about the, the ECG, the initial ECG, where we were taught, uh, taught those days by the cardiologist, the shape of the ST elevation. Was there any clue that, that the two leads were not identical? One yeah. was sloping upwards. You know, we were taught, you know, that it should be Know, this, uh, look at the shape of the ST elevation as well. And of course, uh, you know, even with all this modern technology, should we go for an angiogram even without a chest X-ray? What are your thoughts? And uh, shouldn't we sort of have a guideline for the medical wards, junior staff uh, in managing a chest pain, uh, you know, rather than rushing through the, the protocol? Uh, you know, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Yes, sir. Anyway, uh, in patient presenting chest pain, and uh, there are no definitive criteria or features to suggest aortic dissection by ECG. But uh, as I mentioned, it's about 3% of aortic dissection cases, which might involve the coronary artery, which can present with the situation of various ECG changes. So, as I mentioned previously, it always has. Always keep the clinical suspicions of other different di differential diagnosis initially rather than rushing or depending on the ECGs and other things. So, which is the most important thing, it will prevent disastrous things and the clinical history. So, even I have to say that even that case that I have presented, so patient has managed at a local hospital, so patient directly comes mm -hmm. to the ETU in our hospital, the tertiary care. So we are taking the decision at ET what to do. So in a ET, which is a busy setup, we can't go. We are not usually going for thorough clinical examination or history. So looking at this, so we think that it is a acute ST-ocean myopathy infarction, which is reasonable in some setup, and directly taken to the cath lab and perform the procedure. So and also as I mentioned, so in the guideline base. So there are time limits, so we are stressed to perform the procedures during that uh, definitive time. So that may might be the cause uh, for the miss, uh, I mean, the initial lack of evaluation, those kind of patients. So again, the best thing is get the proper, take some time, get the proper history. Okay, thank you. So maybe I can ask the uh, seniors also, whether uh, again the chest x-ray, whether we should made, make it uh, sort of mandatory before uh, uh, is there evidence for that 
or for before angiogram in a case with the acute ST elevation, so called F1. Actually, if the history and examination is suggestive of aortic resection, if that is an unusual thing, we can go for it. Otherwise, if they are clear cut history and ECG suggest of ST elevation, none of the guidelines is they go okay. for US or Australia, they won't go for chest X or even other ECG. Usually, patients directly come from ambulance to cat lab bypassing the ETU, so there is no way in this patient uh, if the history in a typical chest pain like in somebody the hearing type pain or the blood pressure or murmur somebody heard the murmur before coming to cath lab there is a definite place but otherwise no place Adam, do you have anything guys? That excellent actually lecture and uh, presentation, but it is also very interesting that we had a dissection. You anyway, we have to take a few minutes to get a history from the patient or to ask when for allergies. So, as he was saying, the history definitely is a little bit suggestive. And we had a dissection purely diagnosed by the house officer because he very briefly checked for all the peripheral pulses and he called us and told us that there is a low volume femoral pulses. But the ECG shows acute inferior STEMI. So we, as I heard, the STEMI was likely going to be a dissection. We asked to transfer immediately and it turned out to be a dissection. So just a few minutes you can spend just feeling the femoral pulses and, you know, the radial pulses. That doesn't take long, actually. As soon as you ask the history for allergy, it's well worth, especially for most of them present actually with inferior MIs versus anterior. And also another like comment I like to do that actually you spoke about endovascular therapy, but there's another thing also that we are doing for radiology that's kind of a bridging therapy because now this uh, TIVA, the VAR that you were saying is actually costs us about 1.6 million. It's not available in Sri Lanka and we cannot do it on emergency basis. But what we can do is we do a thing called aortic perforation because most of these patients actually die because of the high pressure in the false lumen. So they have two lumens, a true lumen and the false lumen, and a very high pressure in the false lumen, which causes like many, a lot of major arteries come from the false lumen, like the mesentrics, they get mesentric ischemia. So if we have some method of equalizing these two pressures in the false lumen and the true lumen, then we can buy some time for the surgeon and buy some time even for endovascular therapy. So we have actually successfully done that in a patient where we have actually perforated from the true lumen to the false lumen, equalized these pressures in the two lumens. So therefore, we can maintain perfusion of all the essential organs, such as the mesentric still we can organize the surgery because these can't be done on emergency basis surgeries. We have to be planned at least for 24 hours to us to do the workup. Just another little thing I like to add that we're actually doing that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that's uh, <coughs> Dr. Tanya Pereira, consultant cardiologist, joining us. Any questions from the audience? Uh, have we unmuted the audience? They can speak. Or uh, if you can put it in, type it in the chat box, I can ask the speaker. Okay, in the absence of any more questions, let me invite uh, Dr. Aruna Vijay Singh to uh, start with this uh, MCQ session. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Aruna, cardiologist from Pandora Base Hospital. So, in, I'm going to discuss a few MCQs, basically case-based discussion, and at the end of the case, there will be a few MCQs. Uh, I'm glad to see there are 52 participants, and if anybody wants to ask any questions, you can unmute and ask directly, or you can... it in the chat box or we can answer at the same time. The first case is, yeah. most of the cases are real cases. I, I, a 54-year-old male patient with hypertension, he has been defaulted for treatment for a couple of months, came with exertional chest pain for last three months. Basically, he, what he described is once he gets chest pain when he walks 500, to one kilo, 500 meters or one kilometer and when he climbs stairs for three or four levels, at work and it has been there for three months 
basically class three, uh, uh, NIHA class, uh, Canadian classification class one or two in China. Chris Pector is hypertension and apart from that, he smokes few cigarettes per day and father died of MI at the age of 68 years. It's not a very significant family history. So at the time of consultation, air blood pressure was 160 by 90, it was normal. This is his ECG, apparently normal ECG. Yeah. What do you think about this chest pain? It's basically diagnosis is a typical angina I want to make. It's a following criteria, classical chest pain, precipitated by physical exertion and relieved by rest. A typical angina, non-angina classification. So the first question is, what are you going to start at this? Now we have made the diagnosis. This is stable angina, chronic coronary syndrome. So imagine you are in an OPD clinic and are you going to start drugs or wait for instance? You can, both options are available. So the question is whether you are going to start aspirin alone or start aspirin and clopidogrel both. The third one is start atorvastatin 40 milligram without a lipid profile or you start at a 10 milligram nocte and wait for the lipid profile to intensify at a statin treatment. What would you do? Uh, there's a response in the chat box from one listener. Yes. So they have put two uh, calls. Dr. Sashika Samarasinghe, uh, it's first one is true, they start as pain. Uh, second one is fall. Third one is again false. And final, uh, the fourth one is correct. Any other responses? Uh, yes. Someone, most of the responses says first one is correct and second one is wrong, but there is uh, some controversy about the third and fourth answers. Out of four responses, two people says, anyway, I will go to the answers. Or oh, should I wait? No, go to the answers. Yeah. So different combinations are there. There is somebody saying, oh, first three are correct. Yeah. Basically, this uh, uh, diagnosis is chronic coronary syndrome, a stable angina. There is no indication to start dual antiplatelets. There's a place for dual antiplatelet in general. The recent onset angina is especially class three or four. But this class four, and I said patient can walk more than 500 meters on flat. So definitely we this cannot be considered as unstable angina. So there's no place for dual antiplatelet. It is, you can start aspirin or there's a problem with aspirin, you can start clopidogrel. So first one is for correct, second one is wrong. Then the third or fourth, once we make the diagnosis of chronic coronary syndrome, there's definitely patient come in so high risk category. So we have to go for high intensity treatments. So usually it is the, we can start lipid uh, at a certain without lipid profile, but if you, the, it's somebody, someone can argue with this answer, but you don't have to wait. You don't have to start at a certain 10 milligram because of low intensity or high risk patients, but the true LDL is very low, already below 55. Yeah, it's reasonable. That's what I want to make sure. So basically, your answer source, first one is correct. The third one is correct. Can I go to? So if you're going to start medications, what are the medications you are going to start now? The first combination has been adjusted in for all four or five. The telmisartan and HCT, because blood pressure is 160 and defaulted. It's a diagnosed patient with hypertension. So there is no question about diagnosis of hypertension. So tell me Sartan and HCT, bisoprolol and diltiazine, bisoprolol and amlodipine, ISMN and ranolacine, filosartan and ranolacine. Out of this, that's a one response call in the fifth one is correct. Filosartan and ranolacine. The majority says third one, we'll go to the recent guideline. So basically, first step would be for this is angina, the beta blockers have calcium channel blockers are preferred. Basically, there is, is not a black and white answer. If you start ranolacine or nitrate or niperandil, you can say wrong, but 
this basically depend on the guidelines the first step would be the beta blocker or calcium channel blocker and they depend on the heart rate if the heart rate is low amlodipine would be preferred or heart rate is high and if you can't start beta blocker diltiazem or verapamil would be a best option and the second line again combination of beta blocker, calcium channel blockers and beta blockers for long acting nitrates you can there are other options as a second line so basically based on this and the practical situation uh, definitely we need anti angina we all agree so the first option is out tell me sarn h it is not anti angina then all other four there are anti angina bisoprolol and diltiazem are not good it's not a contraindicated but we have to be very careful because both can reduce heart rate so bisoprolol and diltiazem can cause significant bradycardia so it's not the best option but and the third one is bisoprolol and amlodipine because if you go to the ecg heart rate is around 75 80 definitely you can start with the bisoprolol or diltiazem and if you start diltiazem you can't start amlodipine because they both are first line anti angina so bisoprolol and amlodipine is a good option ism and ranolazine yes you can't start. you can start but the, the problem with ism and ranolazine there's no anti hypertensive for this patient so you need anti hypertensive as well so the fourth is definitely wrong The fifth one, aspirin, atorvastatin, dosartan, ranolazine. Yes, you may argue, but according to the guidelines and the, if you are practicing in Sri Lanka, the cost, everything considering, I think it's not the best option. So I, according to the ESC guidelines and the Sri Lankan setup, three would be the best option. Basically, the first line anti-angina and it covers anti-hypertensive and anti-angina properties both. The any patient with ischemic heart disease and hypertension, beta blockers are not first line anti-hypertensives, but when they have ischemic heart disease beta block and uh, even heart failure beta blockers be, become automatically become first line anti hypertensives of choice i may add something if uh, the patient was a diabetic will it change uh, uh, yeah. uh, for the diabetic control we might consider sglt2 inhibitors for the heart failure preventions but and 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 channel property and heart hypertension property there won't be much of thinking about you know diabetics we use the first line we start losarta tell me sir ah yes so the hypertension part definitely hypertension part whether there is a so if the affordability is not not a problem in a diabetic in this scenario would you go for losarta and gastrocnemius yeah uh, as inhibitor or arb will for the hypertension part and anti angina part we may consider calcium channel blocker or ism or ranolazine but still the first line should be a beta blocker or a calcium, calcium channel blocker for the angina so and the hypertension yes losartan would be the first line in case of diabetic and especially there is a protein urea microalbumin urea is positive so microalbumin urea negative i am not very sure if there is a place for losartan okay So basically, there are a few anti-angiogens: beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, ranolazine, nitro, uh, the nicorandil, ISM, and long-acting preparations are commonly used and uh, anti-angiogens in Sri Lanka. Even bradine, there is a limited place, provided the we can't reduce heart rate uh, below seventy with the use of beta blocker or diltiazem or verapamil. Uh, then there is a place for even bradine. so the next investigation this way from the very first consultation since the patient has classical angina prefer for coronary angiogram because patient has a classical angina you directly request a coronary angiogram request exi ccg request a ct ca request stress echocardiogram or stress mri request ct calcium score not the ct ca ct ca means ct coronary angiogram somebody has requested coronary angiogram good most of the cardiologist will like it then third ctca i think okay majority says coronary angiogram but it's depend everything depend on the pretest probability and the pretest prob something called pretest probability so this patient definitely 
not a low risk patient because it's a hypertension smoking and classical angina according to the euro esc pretest probability it's coming to the intermediate category or uh, because the risk is uh, i didn't have the slide yet it's around 22% pretest probability so it's in the intermediate category and uh, if you go through the small text things you know, if you invasive coronary angiograms there's a place for high clinical likelihood and severe symptoms refracted through medical therapy typical angina at low level of exercise and clinical evaluation including exercise ecg indicate high risk of events lv dysfunction suggestive of coronary artery disease so at the beginning if you are going to go for coronary invasive coronary angiogram there are very limited space it has to be a patient has to be on high clinical likelihood as well as he has beyond anti 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 angiogenals and despite minimum of two anti angiogenals and patient having symptoms that's one criteria other one is if the patient has lv dysfunction definitely we have to go for that other thing is if the other stress test is positive either exercise ecg or whatever positive then there's a place for coronary angiogram another most of the other patients according to the guideline non invasive test might be the idea it can be exercise ecg stress echo stress mri or perfusion scan whatever is the 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 correct answer is exercise ecg or request stress echo mri uh, coronary angiogram is not the ideal investigation according to the guideline and the fifth one again wrong because calcium score no place at this stage because patient is definitely intermediate or high risk and ctco usually reserved for low risk people so prefer preferentially considered low clinical likelihood patients so what usually happen is in this in imagine the patient came to nhsl or whatever government hospital we will request a we will start him on anti angiogenals do basic blood test and request exercise ecg or patient depending the affordability and the availability we might request other investigations so the medical registrar request exercise ecg and it came in as positive at stage 3 or 2 whatever then referred for coronary angiogram date was given in 3 months time so and he has been started on at least two anti angiograms and by the time patient comes to coronary angiogram in 3 or 4 months time patient is asymptomatic this is not the frequent case but sometimes we see this kind of patients in our clinical practice we give date in 6 month time and by the time they come to us again they are more or less asymptomatic so this is the angiogram hey there's angry looking lesion 90% but patient is asymptomatic so what are the benefit of stenting of this patient improve mortality and future stemis there is no mortality improvement but reduce future stemia and non stemis reduce the risk of development of lv dysfunction due to ischemia in future fourth one is help to reduce anti angiogenic symptoms and quality of life the final answer is no enough evidence to talk about mortality or mi reduction while you are answering i think including myself most of the college would put a stent into this now is it better <laughs> but yeah this i took it from somewhere so imagine patient has a definitely more than 70% lesion on the angiogram not in the left main or proximal lad it may be mid lad circumflex or rca smooth lesion 8 90% what would you do i am actually asking not what you do do if you put a stent there what are the benefits okay so basically now this is setup is chronic stable angina or chronic coronary syndrome there are very limited we have enough evidence because stenting is more than 30 years now stenting are available so we have very large randomized trials meta analysis so the fifth answer is out we have good evidence to talk about mortality and mi reduction so up to now there is no there is no evidence to suggest that in chronic coronary syndrome stent in improve mortality so the first one is out there is no evidence to suggest it improves mortality except in proximal lad or left main lesions and there are no evidence to suggest that it will reduce stemis and non stemis apart from few trials which in all the ffr 
most of the trials says there is no evidence to suggest that the stenting will reduce future STEMI or non-STEMI. Basically, stenting in chronic coronary syndrome won't reduce MI. And it won't reduce the development of LD dysfunction as well. So basically, what stenting does in chronic coronary syndrome is it reduces symptoms. So we can reduce antianginals and definitely it will reduce the quality of life. So patient might be on three drugs instead of five drugs and he might be able to do more work and he will be happy. But there is no reduction in mortality, no reduction in MI, no reduction in LD, future LD dysfunction. In patient, the, when we come to the LV dysfunction, the, I am talking about patients with normal LV function. So the answers will be, answers is fourth is the correct one, others are wrong. Just remember, it doesn't mean that PCI is wrong. That's what I say, even I will be, I, uh, I do the stenting for 90% lesion and I, I won't leave it, but there is no benefit in terms of mortality future MI, so LV dysfunction. Definitely the stenting improve the quality of life and symptoms. Uh, you say it should be improved quality of life, no? Yes. Reduce. Four seconds. Ah, reduce, yeah. Improve, uh, reduce symptoms and improve quality of life. Quality of life. And is there a, so for the non-specialists, like when the you know, registrars and the senior registrars, general medical, Staff, if there is a guideline on the quality of life, I mean, a validated questionnaire or like a few questions that you ask, or how, how, do, how do you measure the quality of life? I mean, uh, actually, we, we experience might uh, get it, but for the yeah. specialists, there are enough studies available in the net. But yeah. actually, for your questions, anybody going to answer? Uh, this is uh, Guru Paran. Hello. Yes. Hello, sir. You're welcome. Yes, yes. Uh, the European Society of Cardiology has a set of uh, guidelines how to assess quality of living, but uh, those are only available to for purchase. Uh, so we have been trying to download it, but it's not available for free download. But there is a guideline how to assess quality of life, quality of life uh, under European Society of Guide, for European Society of Cardiology guidelines. Okay. They say if somebody wants to validate it for to another language, it will be given free of charge. Yeah, thanks, Guru. Yeah, thank you, sir. So this is a meta-analysis recently published in circulation. Effect of percutaneous coronary intervention on death and myocardial infarction stratified by stable and unstable coronary artery disease. It's meta the re most recent meta-analysis, and it says. PCI prevent death, cardiac death, myocardial infarction in patients presenting with unstable coronary artery disease. So there is acute coronary syndrome. Yes, it reduces mortality, future MI, and it improves the prognosis. But in patients with truly stable coronary artery disease, PCI shows no evidence of an effect on any of these outcomes. So when it comes to the secondary prevention of these patients, the the first answer is we keep the target of blood, the hypertension patient blood pressure target should be 140 by 90. LDL target should be less than 70. Third one is acetamib has prognostic benefit when added to statins if LDL target cannot be achieved only with statins. Fourth one is this patient will benefit from empagliflozin or whatever SGLT2 inhibitors. Then the fifth one is minimum of six month BAPT followed by lifelong single antiplatelet is recommended. So what is the blood pressure target for general population nowadays, apart from very specific groups? For CKD, slightly different patients with CKD, but most of other patients, target blood pressures are now lower compared to when, when we were medical registrars, the target was 140 by 90 or 140 by 80. But now most of the people, it is 130 by 80. It's 130 by 80, actually, not the 90. Uh, general public, as well as patients with ischemic heart disease, the target blood pressure is 130 by 80. And it should not go below 120 as well. And the diastolic pressure should not go below 170. So basically, we have to keep that pressure in 120s and 70s. The target LDL, any idea? So 
according to the ESC guidelines and even India has published a very good guideline for lipids. If you are interested, you can go through because Indian guidelines are more applicable for us because we are very close to India when, when it comes to the cardiovascular risk. We have very high risk compared to the European, so we can't directly apply European guidelines for our population because basically we are 1.4 to 1.6 times higher. Our cardiovascular risk is 1.4 to 1.6 times higher than the European uh, population. So the guideline targets and the special target can be different for us and them. So LDL target should be 55. Any patient with ischemic heart disease or even stroke, high risk category or diabetic and other complicated diabetic considered at high risk patients and their blood pressure target should be uh, less than 55. So ge general public it is 116. The low, uh, the intermediate risk it is uh, 100. Then the high risk seven, uh, 70. Very high risk this patient it's less than 55. For this patient, for any patient with ischemic heart disease, remember LDL target is less than 55. So it can be stable angina or unstable angina, non STEMI or STEMI. Target is less than 55. So is it my best prognostic benefit? Yes, it's true. So the, when it comes to the prognosis, the fibrates has no benefit, prognostic benefits, only statins and acetamiban, the newer injectable agents have prognostic benefits. The fourth one is this patient benefit from empagliflozin, sorry, SGLT2 inhibitors. Basically, this patient's LV function is normal. So if patient has diabetic and ischemic heart disease, even LV function is normal, they are SGLT2 inhibitors are beneficial prognostic terms. So all diabetic patients and all the ischemic heart disease patients with diabetic SGLT2 inhibitors are, should be higher in diabetic medications. If patient doesn't have diabetic and patient, patient doesn't have LV dysfunction, that's no place for SGLT2 inhibitors. Am I correct? Yes, uh, interesting. The European guidelines, uh, even your European cardiology guidelines came out with first line uh, therapy uh, uh, for this category with uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Yes. But the diabetes world, it's second line now. Our uh, guidelines, the ADA and the ESC, they have recommend after metformin, right. uh, if there's no contraindication for metformin, second line therapy should be uh, SGLT2 inhibitor for this category. And interesting, when we were students, the five breaths came out in a big way. Maybe I haven't read after that. The small, dense LDL theory and that five breaths had a, a better effect. That is not proven anymore. Or you said there is no benefit with five breaths? There is no much evidence. That's theoretical. There are a lot of concerns about five breaths and small, dense LDL. But the, when it comes to the real life or registries or the large trials, they there are no much it. benefits. Right. Definitely, as the STMI goals, I think a few years back, that's a large trial showing that STMI is beneficial when it's added to statins. So, mm -hmm. in a, this is, I think, uh, because the Sri Lankans, they have high triglycerides most of the time. And our clinicians, you know, physicians, uh, non specialists, uh, cardiologists may be adding fibrates to get the, we sometimes change the atorvastatin to fibrates to get the triglycerides down. So, you think it's not a very good idea? Uh, in terms of uh, the cardiovascular risk? Uh, what the even guideline suggest is to keep a statin, and if the triglyceride target is not achieved, we can top add a fibrate. But fibrate alone is not a good option for patients with ischemic heart disease. Yes. Madam, do you have to tell anything? Then it's fine, no? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So minimum of six months DAPT followed by lifelong single antiplatelet that is recommended. This is for stable angina, it's minimum of six months. For acute coronary syndrome, it is a 12 month. It's not a must criteria. You can check, depend on the patient's bleeding risk and the thrombotic risk. This general population, you have to remember, it is six month DAPT. And usually after six months, you can omit the stable angina. And acute coronary syndrome, it's 12 months. But we see a lot of patients, even after many years, on DAP, especially not medically managed patients are going on dual antiplatelet treatment for years and years. If you see those kind of patients, please stop one antiplatelet. Assess their risk and act accordingly. 
So these the blood pressure targets according to the recent hypertension guidelines. It's depend on the age. The patient is age is less than 65. Target is less than 130 by 90, 80. The age is more than 65. It is 140 by 80. For irrespective of any age, diastolic target is 80. Remember it. The systolic target, 134 less than 65, and above 65, it is 140. The 140 is the diagnostic criteria. 140 to 90 is the diagnostic criteria. So this is the LDL targets. I will, I just want to briefly touch it. In secondary prevention of patients with very high risk, this like this patient, LDL target is less than 55. In, and others, as I mentioned here, 70, 100, 100 for moderate risk and low risk people, it is 116. According to the newer guideline, I think most of the people will be on statins if this LDL levels are above 130, 120. Let's move to the case. next case. This is a 36-year-old lady admitted with worsening shortness of breath for one month duration. She has no noted reduced exercise capacity and exertional shortness of breath with minimal ex activity for last couple of months. The ECG shows LBB and echocardiogram was done and it shows severely reduced LV, LV function with a global hypokinase and LV dilated is around 60 millimeters dilated LV. HB was, for the, for the, when it comes to the blood counts, he was iron deficiency anemia. HB 10.2, ferritin was low. The cutoff is cutoff for heart failure is 100. Normal renal liver and thyroid functions. So basically, a young lady with severe LV dysfunction, LBB, iron deficiency, anemia. The questions are, the 30 to 40 percent of patients with chronic cardiac failure have normal ECG. The second one is, if troponin is positive, patient should be treated as non-STEMI with enoxaparin and DAPT unless proven otherwise. Third one is, normal BNP levels virtually rule out chronic heart failure. Fourth one, invasive coronary angiogram or CTCA is useful to rule out coronary artery disease. The last one is cardiac MRI with the late gadolinium enhancement can help to differentiate ischemic heart failure from the dilated cardiomyopathy. So if you go through the guideline and literature, it says 90% of, of the time ECGs are abnormal. Basically, if you see a normal ECG, be very suspicious if you make if you are going to make the diagnosis of heart failure. So, according to the both ESC and ACC guidelines, it clearly says it's ninety percent sense eighty nine to ninety two percent sensitivity of ECG. So basically, ten percent of the population with heart failure patients will have normal ECG, not thirty to forty percent. Ninety percent of the patients will have abnormal ECG. The second one is this is a common in our we see this in our wards most of the time. These patients come with acute shortness of breath and we have high sensitive troponin and these are marginally positive, 150, 200, not rising as well. So, and we treat them as non-STEMI. Presentation is worsening of heart failure and we treat them as non-STEMI. So, actually this is false because most of the patient, uh, patients with heart failure will have marginally elevated troponin, it's slightly positive, not, uh, not thousands. These are uh, usually cut off is 10 or 15, The if you do the high, high sensitive troponin, 10 to 20 is the cutoff level. Uh, then if you have 100 or 150, it's acceptable. So it's basically depend on the history and other ECG changes, everything we have to consider before making the diagnosis of non stem in this kind of population. So if the troponin is patient, patient should be treated as non stem it is wrong because some people have marginally elevated troponin because of the ongoing LV damage. Normal BNP levels virtually rule out chronic heart failure. Yes, this is correct. The BNP has a very, uh, it's a good test and it will be, it will become more prevalent in future. Even before echocardiogram, we can do the BNPs and make sure patient has a heart failure or not. There are a lot of other causes which can cause falsely positive BNP. So B positive BNP won't, diagnose heart failure, but negative BNP definitely rule out. The sensitivity is more than 98%, the negative predictive value. 
Invasive coronary angiogram or CTCA is useful to rule out coronary artery disease. Whenever there is a severe LV dysfunction, the, you might get an idea from the echocardiogram with the ischemic or not, but for the guideline, the ideal management, we have to exclude coronary artery disease as the cause of heart failure. So definitely we need to do a CTCA or coronary angiogram depending on their pretest probability. If the patient is minimally has low risk for ischemic heart disease, we can do a CT coronary angiogram and rule out it. But if the patient has diabetic, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, and multiple other risk factors, and the pretest probability is high, and the echocardiogram also favor ischemic, either thin walls, uh, regional wall, hypokinesia, then we can go for coronary angiogram. And this patient, I told it's a global hypokinesia, dilated LV, 35-year-old lady, CTCA would be the idea to rule out coronary artery disease. When it comes to the heart failure, where CMR has, can give a lot of information, apart from it can exclude the ischemia as well as, in addition, it can give idea about the underlying etiology, whether the patient has a dilated cardiomyopathy or patient has infiltrative disease. So if you could take a single test, cardiac MRI would be the ideal test for the diagnosis. The, this kind of patients with LV dysfunction. Unfortunately, it is not available, freely available in Sri Lanka, in the government sector. In Sri Lanka, NHSLE, they do cardiac MRI, but I have no much experience to comment about it. And even uh, without going to invasive coronary angiogram, cardiac MRI would be helpful. Yes, definitely. Area. Because uh, if you do a platelet enhancement, you can clearly differentiate ischemia and uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. The last question is depend on the way this late gadolinium enhancement happened. If the subendocardial late gadolinium enhancement favor ischemia, and if it is a middle range, it's dilated cardiomyopathy. And if you see other, uh, but imagine if, it, yeah. So definitely um, CMR can exclude ischemia. If it's exclude ischemia, we don't have to go for coronary angiogram. There's a question for you. Uh, for how long do you have to uh, give dual antiplatelet uh, treatment after CTA? You answered. Not yeah, it's uh, basically if the stable and the current uh, the modern stent, the minimum is one month. But according to the guideline, you can give. You have to give six months unless the bleeding risk is low. So imagine the patient has minimal bleeding risk and minimum average uh, recurrent thrombotic risk. The both are more or less average. I am talking about average man, six months after stable angina and one year after acute coronary syndrome. But if the patient's thrombotic risk is high, major patients have multiple risk factors, recurrent events, complex PCI, then there's a place for extended period of dual antiplatelets. So some patients might be on one year, two year, three year. There are evidence to support extended antiplatelet treatment up to three years can be beneficial to reduce the uh, recurrent thrombotic event, but definitely it will increase the bleeding risk. It can be a small risk, but definitely the longer the duration of antiplatelet, higher the risk of bleeding. And if you want to stop uh, antiplatelet, you can, uh, most of with modern stents, you can stop after one month safely, but better to get a cardiology opinion if you are going to stop antiplatelet within first month and six months. Right. Your stems, uh, second and third stems, if you uh, have a normal BNP and the troponin is marginally raised, then you could go for enoxaparin and dual antiplatelet. Basically, if the normal BNP mean heart fail is unlikely, so the then the then troponin is rise. You have to take the history carefully. If somebody come with the imagine non-specific chest pain, it can be myoperic myopericarditis. Troponin can be marginal raised. BNP is normal. So it's depend on the clinical circumstances. We do, we should not make any diagnosis based on troponin or ECG or maybe BNP alone. So we have to get the proper history. Examination might be helpful. Then depend on the clinical scenario, you make the diagnosis. Somebody has ah, yes, the, the first one is false because it's a 10 per, less than 10%. The second one is patient should be treated as non stemy There is no nothing like that. It may be non stemy It may be just a heart failure itself causing slightly elevated troponin. Second one falls. Third one is correct. Fourth one is correct. Fifth one is correct. So somebody has answered it correctly. Yeah. It's a bit. Yeah. It's good. It's 
Dr. Fatima with uh, specific questions. So, congr congratulations. Uh, the true or false regarding management of this patient. Okay, so, you know, the now patient has heart failure. AC inhibitor ARB should be given first and if well to tolerated, start ARNI. Angiotensin, renin, neprilysin inhibitor, it is not freely available in Sri Lanka, but imagine if it is freely available, are you going to give AC inhibitor ARB first and well tolerated? You are going to start ARNI. The second one is ARB and AC inhibitors are equally beneficial in heart failure. Third one is this SGLT2 inhibitors reduce mortality and hospitalization in heart failure patient, this patient, the heart failure. The fourth one is ICD should be considered to reduce VTVF as patient's EF is less than 35. So the final one is IV iron, but not oral iron can improve exercise capacity, symptoms, and quality of life and hospitalization. Because these patients, I told HB is low and iron definitely iron deficiency anemia is there. So is there any evidence to support IV iron or oral iron? That's what I want to check. Somebody has the answer. Yes. First two, he says is uh, false. He or she says uh, false. Three and four, two, and the last one, false. Yes, it's a good try. Excellent. The first one, ACE inhibitors and ARB should be given first and if well tolerated, start ARNI. It was the practice few years back. Now it is out. So we can start ARNI as the first line. So we don't have to try with ACE inhibitor or ARB if it is available, but the, probably it will be available in a couple of years in Sri Lanka. The second one is ARB and ACE inhibitors are equally beneficial. Most of us believe that they act more or less in a different process, but the final outcome is the same, the action. So they are equally beneficial. It is not so. The ACE inhibitors are superior. There we have enough evidence to support it. Superior to ARBs. Only problem with the ACE inhibitors, up to 20% of the people can get a dry cough. So that's the main fear of many physicians. And that's why many people are on ARB not, and not on ACE inhibitors. Otherwise, ACE inhibitors are superior to ARB. Not only in heart failure, even in hypertension, we have enough evidence. Even for diabetes, we have good, strong evidence to support ACE inhibitors or ARP. The third one is SGLT2 inhibitors reduce mortality and hospitalization. Yes, it's true. And empagliflozin has a place for diastolic dysfunction as well, though it's not in recent guidelines because the trial came after guideline publication. So empagliflozin has place for diastolic dysfunction as well as systolic dysfunction. Dapagliposone, for the time being, is only for systolic dysfunction. ICD should be considered to reduce VF and VT as patients is EF is less than 35. I think this, is unfair, this can be unfair question for medical registrars, but if you have an idea, it's good. This patient has LBB. So I initially I told that LBB. So in the presence of LBB, there is a, we, the, we have to resynchronize them. So cardiac resynchronization is the, our main target. So then sometimes the EF improves, then we, they don't need ICD. In ideal setup, all patients, the, any patients with a heart failure less, and ejection fraction less than 35 require either ICD or CRT. If there's a QRS duration is broad, broad complex, then CR, we have to go for CRT, the cardiac synchronization. And then if it, uh, EF remain low, because they see after CRT, some people EF improves, then they don't need ICD. If the CR, after CRT, if the EF remain low, we can go for ICD. They, we don't have to insert it, we can upgrade it. It's called CRTD. I think it's a bit specific question. So this is a false. I just want, but anyway, if you have uh, some idea that patient will need ICD or CRTD, that's good enough. And then you have to refer to a cardiologist for consideration. That's the sole purpose of this question. The last one is IV iron, but not oral iron can improve exercise capacity, symptoms, and quality of life. Yes, this is true. We don't know what's the exact reason, but IV iron has shown benefit, prognosis, uh, benefits in not the prognostic benefit, the other exercise capacity, symptoms, quality of life, hospitalization. 
IV ion is good if the serum ferrit ferritin is less than 100. Now, unfortunately, the trials are available only for one form of IV ion, that is iron. Uh, it's the, the, that form of iron treatment is not available in Sri Lanka. I can't exactly remember the, the iron form. We have three types of IV iron preparations available in the world. The evidence support only one form of iron, IV iron. So the currently Sri Lanka available one is, we don't have evidence. So we have to wait for a few years until research evidence come. So until that, we can't use our IV preparations for heart failure patients. Yeah, I remember this uh, study, you know, wasn't there a thing you are not going by, if I'm correct, not by ferritin. I think it's the transfer in saturation. About 20%. Yeah, it's actually that is it's beneficial for heart failure or something. I vaguely remember. It's uh, exactly you are correct, sir. It's, uh, it's a very variable, you know, inflammatory marker as well. No? So you can't go by ferritin. I, uh, I remember a transfer in saturation cutoff. Yeah, you are exactly correct, sir. The, what's the cutoffs are serum ferritin less than 100. You don't need transfer in saturation because the, it's confirmed. Because if they, even though there's a inflammatory market, it is reduced. So then, but if the serum ferritin is 100 and 200, then we can't make the diagnosis. In such cases, we have to go by transfer and saturation about less than 20%. Okay. But if the serum ferritin is about 200, we don't have to treat them. So basically, it's less than 100. It's definitely iron deficiency anemia in between 100 and 200. We have to go with transfer and saturation. Then it has to be less than 20%. If the serum ferritin is about 20, uh, 200, we don't treat IV iron. But unfortunately, this IV iron preparation used for particular research is not available in Sri Lanka. So I just want to make sure that the place of ACE inhibitors and AR with the, all the ACC guidelines and, and the ESC guidelines says ARB should use when there is a contraindication for ARP, ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors are intolerant. This ACE guideline is quite a bit old guideline. When if ACE inhibitors not tolerated, contraindicated, use ARP. So remember, ACE inhibitors are preferred over ARP and cheaper. The case three, 56-year-old lady with well-controlled type 2 diabetic for three years, intermittent retrosternal chest discomfort, Rather true pain for last one day. Each episode lasts five to ten minutes at rest, not relieved by PP. She, she thought it's a gastritis and she has taken omeprazole frequently. She's a diabetic. And this is the ECG on admission. This is a true case. Basically, there is nothing much. So on the ETU patient was pain free. Troponin, uh, our hospital, we have zero, we do zero hour and three hour, both came as negative. Routine bloods were basically negative. So we thought it is gastritis, not we, the emergency consultant. Even I, I, if I was there, I would do the same. Repeat the ECG one hour later, there is no much changes. But if you are very careful, there is right T inversions compared to previous one. And there is a flattening of T's, and that lateral V5, V6, uh, those days we used to call this biphasic T, is there a thing like yeah, that? V2, there V3, V4, there's slight biphasic uh, T. Is that significant? That uh, or just a normal radiation? Yeah, this can be significant with the given history because the patient came with chest pain, at least we have to repeat these. Sometimes we the both ECGs are normal now. Troponin also negative. We are planning to discharge actually the patient. But uh, so while awaiting discharge, it takes almost six hours. You know now it you not very efficient. Patient develop an, another chest pain, and it settled quickly with omeprazole. But the, we repeat another ECG. This at eight hours. So we request it at around seven hour. ECG technician came in one hour time and did the ECG. Now there is some dynamic changes. So what's the diagnosis? The unstable angina, troponin negative. 
anyway. So the question based on this case, negative predictive value of high sensitivity, the now we are moving towards this high sensitive troponin, zero hour and one hour, zero hour, two hour, zero hour, three hour algorithm. So you have to know something about these things. The negative predictive value of high sensitive troponin, zero hour and three hour is more than 99% and positive predictive value of sale algorithm is around 35%. You might not know this, but this is a true fact. So we can safely exclude or rule out significant ischemic acute coronary syndrome if both are negative. It is 99% sure this is not going to be an acute coronary syndrome. And the positive predictive value is 75%. That means one out of four can be a wrong diagnosis. So we admit more patients, but we can safely discharge 99% of patients. So it's the first thing is true. When you come to the patient, since both 0 and 3 hour troponin are negative, he can be dis safely discharged home. The third one is now there are dynamic changes. Admit manage as unstable angina and plan elective angio in 4 to 6 weeks time, angio or even XICCG. The fourth one is patient need early coronary angiogram, ideally before discharge. The fifth one is ECG shows DV inter pattern, which indicate proximal LAD occlusion and impending anterior steady. Our time is up, Aruna, so I think you can answer. And then okay, the, 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 the second one is basically negative, but we have seen dynamic ECG. We can't discharge him. The admit manager's unstable angina. Some people might do this, but basically this is a valence syndrome ECG. So patient need early coronary angiogram, and this is not a deviant. A deviant I will show you later. I just show this uh, the algorithms. The if the low risk is uh, one hour, zero hour, and three hour, one hour negative, the risk of MI at index visit and thirty day MAs are very low. So that's how you can safely discharge him. And if this is positive, the events are very high. This is the patient's angiogram. You show it's a very pro proximal LAD, ninety percent lesion. The valence syndrome T wave. Sorry? Okay. The valence syndrome ischemic chest pain and it's present with the T wave innovations, bypassing T waves in V2 to V4, which is a troponin usually normal or mildly elevated. No other abnormalities, no poor wave progression, no pathological QL. So we can easily miss this. This is a very high risk ECG, valence syndrome. We uh, up to 10 to 20% of the people with the acute coronary syndrome and the uh, non stemis can have valence syndrome. So proximal LAD critical stenosis, and they can develop massive anterostomy within next couple of weeks. Around 50% will develop anterostomy within two weeks. So they need early angio. So you have to convince cardiology SR2 and get the angiogram done. So that biphasic T wave was very critical, no? Yes. So That's okay. the take home I message. I have forgotten the valence syndrome, but I knew there was something there. Yes. So it's a, a thing to remember for the non-specialists so to not to ignore that. Yes, if you see a biphasic T innovations in anterior leads, it can be very sinister. And this rarely this can happen in inferior leads as well. Okay, now the, usually people say esophageal spasm. We are saying no, everything is negative, it could be a esophageal spasm and the typical pain, all that. Sometimes you get the, the inversions as well, no? With the how do you Yeah, I'm okay. not very sure. Non-specific. Yeah. abnormalities. All these people come with these T inversions, yeah. and we get a lot of referrals with slip ventricular strain yes, pattern. I remember also. seeing in OSCE the corkscrew esophagus where there is spasm and they have done the dye. And you get the typical angina. Uh, yeah, but you get, I think, T inversions there, but not the biphasic T. Not the, not the biphasic So, the case number four, this uh, third is... Uh, okay, sure. The time, no? Ah, yes, because sorry. They are, they are going off. So, if any otherwise. questions? Yeah. Okay. Last case, we'll ask for any burning questions, and we should conclude, because the time given is up to 1.30. We are gone about 10 minutes uh, beyond time. And uh, thank you very much for that very interesting session. And it's not only the registrars, I think the non-cardiac non specialists also can learn a lot. 
Uh, any burning questions? I don't see any thing in the chat box. So in the absence of uh, any further questions, uh, let me thank uh, both the speakers, Dr. Sumitha Kumara, Senior Registrar in Cardiology, General Hospital Candy, and Dr. Aruna Vijaysingha, Consultant Cardiologist at Base Hospital Panadura, and of course, the Sri Lanka College of Cardiology for their collaboration with the Sri Lanka Medical Association for this very interesting and useful, clinically relevant, uh, monthly clinical meeting and the topic uh, we had today. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and for uh, the members of the College of Cardiology who are present here as well on behalf of the SLMA. I wish to thank each and everybody who joined us at this lunchtime for one and a half hours and hope you all gain uh, uh, new knowledge and will improve your practice in the uh, general medical world. Thank you very much. One minute. In, I have to uh, do the honors now. Let me call upon uh, Dr. Aruna Vijay Singh to uh, accept the uh, letter of appreciation from the SLMA. Dr. Sumit Kumar. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll conclude the session now.